In this video I will demonstrate the Heathkit AT1 amateur radio transmitter and tell you a bit about its history and features. I will show an AT1 which I recently purchased and am in the process of restoring. The Heathkit company sold electronic kits including a diverse line of amateur radio products. In the early days after marketing primarily kits for test equipment they introduced their first amateur radio product, the AT1 transmitter, in 1953. It sold for $29.50 in kit form, quite a low cost even at that time, a little over $200 in today's money taking inflation into account. The specifications fit ideally with the new United States Novice Class ham radio license, yet it offered future expansion via a VFO and modulator. The radio was made from 1953 through 1956 until it was replaced by the DX20 transmitter in 1957. Let's take a look at the front panel controls. It's crystal controlled with a single crystal socket. An optional VF1 VFO is also available. Next is the power switch. This unit has a pilot lamp which was not standard but was a common modification. A built-in power supply was a nice feature as some transmitters of this era required an external supply. This switch sets the meter reading between final amplifier grid and plate current. There's a center off position. The plate on standby switch turns off high voltage to the oscillator and amplifier tubes when in standby mode. It has a standard quarter inch jack for the code key. This was a CW or Morse code only transmitter. The driver control is for adjusting the oscillator tune circuit. It's not used on 80 meters. There's a four position band switch. The transmitter supports the then current HF bands 80, 40, 20, 15, 11, and 10 meters. 11 meters is no longer an amateur radio band in North America. It became the citizens band in the 1960s. The 15, 11, and 10 meter bands all use the 10 meter band position on the switch. The output control is for tuning the final amplifier tune circuit. Finally, we have the meter for monitoring the final amplifier grid and plate current. The knobs varied. Early units had black Collins like knobs and later they were like mine following the Heathkit DX series style. On the rear panel we have octal sockets for a VFO and modulator and a UHF connector for antenna. The shorting plug was normally connected to the modulator jack when no modulator was being used. AM phone operation was supported with an external modulator circuit. Heathkit did not offer one as a kit but many hams built a home brew one. The all metal case provides good shielding. The chassis is copper plated. Let's take a look inside. It has only three tubes a 5U4 rectifier, 6AG5 oscillator, and 6L6 amplifier. Here we see the power supply transformer and filter choke. These are the output coils for the different bands and the driver and output variable capacitors. And this is the meter. Under the chassis you can see the wiring which was all point to point. It used four large power supply filter caps. This unit has had a number of modifications which was pretty common. Someone added a pilot lamp. A jumper was added internally so an octal plug was not needed when not using a modulator. The major modification was to replace the 6L6 output tube with a 2E26. The 6L6 can handle 30 watts of power input. The 2E26 is about the same but had better gain at higher frequencies. Using this tube involved rewiring a few pins. The plate connection is also to the top cap. I haven't decided yet if I will reverse some of the modifications or leave the radio the way it is. The case had also been painted black. I repainted it with some gray hammer tone that was closer to the original. Like radios of this vintage, there are some safety issues that would not meet current standards. The line cord has no ground connection. Most outlets at that time did not have a ground. There's also no fuse. 
There is quite a high voltage present when the chassis is open, about 450 volts DC, and this also appears on the rear connectors. Worse yet, approximately 400 volts DC is exposed across the code key contacts. You can get quite a jolt from it. Let's now demonstrate the transmitter in operation. To operate, turn on the power and let the tubes warm up. Put in a crystal and plug in a code key. Connect to an antenna or as I've done here, a 50 ohm dummy load through an SWR and power meter. Take it out of standby mode to turn on the high voltage. I'm operating it on the 20 meter band which requires a 40 meter crystal as it uses a frequency doubler on this band. We set the meter to grid current and key it up then adjust the driver control for a peak. Now switch to monitor plate current and adjust for a dip. We want to do this quickly or we can damage the tube. The fact that the meter swings a lot doesn't help speed up this process. You can now see on the power meter about 12 watts of power output and a low SWR into the dummy load. While it works fine into the dummy load, with a real antenna it was recommended to use an antenna coupler like the Heathkit AC1 to match the load. In summary, the AT1 was the right product at the right time. It was a simple design at a low cost and fit the needs of a novice ham radio licensee while being expandable to use a VFO, AM or a power amplifier. On the minus side, it was relatively low power, CW only, crystal controlled and needed an antenna tuner in most cases. These limitations were addressed by the DX20 and later models. Being the first ham radio product made by Heathkit, it is of some historical value and while not extremely rare, they were only produced for four years and so are less common than most later models. There are older hams with fond memories of the AT1 being their first rig. Some built one in the early 1950s and still own and operate it. The AT1 kick-started Heathkit's ham radio business, which had a run for many years. As I record this, Heathkit has just announced that they plan to re-enter the kit business and are considering offering amateur radio products. Let's hope they can make a go of it the second time around.